Transylvania is a region in central Romania, known for medieval towns and mysterious castles, like the Gothic fortress associated with the legend of Dracula, which translates to dragon, and in modern times has become interpreted to mean devil. The city of Brazov is in the Transylvania region of Romania and features colorful Baroque buildings, a towering Gothic black church, and lots of warm people and festive cafes. Let's have a look, shall we? The Roma or Romani are traditionally defined as a nomadic ethnic group, but that hardly says anything. Nomadic simply implies that they wander and they're dispersed into several countries, that's true, but for a more appropriate answer, we need to dig a bit deeper. They're widely known by the sometimes derogatory term gypsies, who culturally and genetically can trace their ancestry back to Mesopotamia and northern regions of the Indian subcontinent, where several population waves are believed to have left sometime between the 6th and 11th century, dispersing into the Middle East, parts of Asia, and of course into Europe. And this is from where we get the term Romania, a word stemming from Rom. Not everyone left, however, and the ones that stayed behind are called Dom. So we have one group that's Rom and another Dom. Rom became the modern Romanian group, and both speak versions of Indo-European languages, just like English, Spanish, German, even Farsi and Sanskrit, none of which originated in India but is where the Romanian gypsy part of this story starts. Now before leaving North India, the gypsies or Roma were part of a population called Damian Arabic, uh, appearing in Kashmiri Sanskrit text as the descendants of Damba, who were performers in the Persian Imperial Dynasty at the peak of the ancient Iranian civilization. And by performer, I mean renowned musicians and poets and probably servants as well as Dhamma or Damba is also extensively used in Hindu and Buddhist literature for a segregated and in with music. And since snakes are deaf, maybe it's the mesmerizing movement that has the serpent so entranced. Kabaliya is one of the most sensuous dance forms of Rajasthan, India performed by an exotic tribe famous for their serpentine movements, an integral part of their culture, a celebration of life as well as death by the Cobra Gypsies. Despite ongoing persecution, they can still be found dancing the Sapara or snake dance that features twirling around with richly embroidered robes, beautifully flaying out in a colorful display. Sapara is also the name given to the snake charmers of India, but what was in the thousands is now limited to only a few hundred, their profession and ancient religion being phased out by law. Their traditional occupation has always been, and you'll love this, to catch snakes and then trade their valuable snake venom. And they don't harm the snakes in any way that I'm aware of, but this practice may be in conflict with the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, contributing to the stigma that some hold against them. They are also scorned for their form of goddess worship, in particular the goddess Kali, or Sarah as they call her. Oração a Santa Sara Kali. Santa Sara Kali. Amen. Also known as the Black Virgin, sharing a symbolic link to the Black Madonna statues, 
brought back into Europe and erected in cathedrals by the Templars. As I cover in a prior video and in one of my books, There are about 500 shrine images or statues of the Black Virgin in various churches across Europe, with many having claimed that the blackening effect is due to the centuries of smoke from candles and incense burners. But to the ungullible, the symbolic link points back to the Indian Kali, the Anatolian Sibyl, the Sumerian Inanna, or Ishtar of Babylon, the Syrian Anat, the Hebrew Lilith, the Greek Diana, of course Egyptian Isis, Neith, and others. Black was the color of fertility and abundance. The rich black soil of the Nile, for example, reflected in the word Kemet, which means black, and did not refer to skin color. With monotheism, the goddess religions of the archaic world were suppressed, their symbols demonized. The sacred sexuality and activities associated with the cult of Inanna and Ishtar were condemned as prostitution and outlawed. Diana became the goddess of the witches, and witches became the vilified term for what became the successors to the female shamans, the wise women of the woods. Their serpent symbol then changed from one of wisdom, as Jesus himself is reported to have said, be wise as serpents. The use of plants, stones, chants, dances and rituals went underground, in many cases literally, with the term occult, which means secret, applied to their activities, which became disguised and disseminated as alchemy, hidden in poetry and mythology, concealed in art and even architecture, and covertly masked in mysterious traditional folk music and dance. Flamenco dance was formed over the centuries from a combination of Iberian, like for example the Basque, Celtic, Gothic, Byzantine, Islamic, Sephardic, Christian, Phoenician, and of course, gypsy culture. precise origins of flamenco dance are therefore unclear, but the North African influence, for example the Berbers around Morocco and other influences from the regions around the Mediterranean are very apparent.
Ole! Interesting correlations have been observed between the Berber percussions and drums and the flamenco rhythms as historians search for the origins of flamenco, seeking out a direct connection to gypsies coming from northern India where the term flamines could be used for Brahmin priests, the nobility of the Aryan caste system, who through their performance of flamenco in Spain may have started as sacred rites and chants, similar to what one might expect among the Islamic Sufis, for example. That said, the ancient book of Manu, a sacred text in Hinduism, suggests that Spain's Gitano community's Romani ancestors are described as belonging to an untouchable caste associated with music and dance, which are not Aryans, but people conquered and subjugated by them. So to gain some context and clarity on this, let's turn to genetics and linguistics for some better insight. Iran is a nation of roughly 80 million citizens, and unlike other parts of the world that have forgotten their racial identity due to things like globalization and now forced immigration and forced multicultural assimilation, Iranians, despite having been converted to Islam en masse, are still very well aware that Aryan implies nobility, as it is etched in cuneiform on ancient Aryan tombs. Iranian tribes living along the northern side of the Alborz Mountains tend to raise livestock and share genetic affinities with people around the Caspian Sea area, for example, Armenians. MTDNA sequences, meaning the maternal uh, genetic lineage, matches that of their neighbors, but their Y chromosomes, meaning the male lineage, most closely resembles those found in groups from the South Caucasus on the border of Eastern Europe and Western Asia. It's interesting that in addition to massive pyramids, many tall, blonde, 4,000 year old mummies have been found along the Silk Road in China, and they were wearing beautifully woven clothing, which reminded people of a, a Celtic style, so much that many assumed they were European, Western European, some insisting they were Irish, but in fact, these Aryan mummies turned out to be haplogroup R1A1A, and R1B is the most common haplogroup in Western Europe, reaching about 80% of the population in Ireland, the Scottish Highlands, Western Wales, the Atlantic fringe of France, and you can see this on this map. However, these Aryan mummies, like all Aryans of the Holocene, meaning the last 10,000 years or so, come from places like Northern Iran, and those who are still pushing for an Irish origins do so out of sheer ignorance, or possibly a sense of nationalism, perhaps, but like with the Caucasian mummies of Egypt, DNA trumps emotional arguments and political agendas. The mummies from China don't look like they should be in China. They look like they should be in Denmark or Ireland or Northern Germany because they look like people from over there. So what are these guys doing so many hundreds, thousands of miles to the east? DNA steps up to the plate and they can tell us where they came from. Archaeologist steps up to the plate and says when they may have come over. Combine the two, you got the family history and the kitten caboodle that they lived in. What are these people doing there? So long ago, well before the opening of the Silk Road, which is dated to 138 BC, these mummies date back, some of them, to 2000 BC. We are, in our bodies, the carrier of an archive, a genetic archive. It tells if you were to study me where I'm from and if I studied you where you're from. And there's no lying about it. In your books, you might say you're from another place, but your genetics will tell us exactly where you're from. We all carry in us, males and females, DNA that comes from our maternal line, through our mothers and grandmothers. So why is that important? For starters, it allows people who study that aspect of genetics in any individual to retrace the history of that particular person through the mother's lineage, the uh, female mummies were mostly of local origin. However, there's another type of testing, the Y chromosome testing, which is the male line. 
the males came from parts further west, not necessarily Ireland, but places like Iran, maybe towards uh, parts of Turkey. The mom's side and the grandmother's side is from the Tarim Basin, and the father's and the grandfather's side were moving in with their sheep, with their herds, slowly but surely, and having families, living their daily lives. So that is an additional aspect that the archaeological part to some extent corroborates but doesn't tell in that great a detail. And that's the wonderful thing about DNA testing. The Punjabi snake goddess worshippers of the Indus Valley is where we can trace back the flamboyant dresses and alluring dance of the proud and fearless wandering gypsies. Zoroastrianism as a philosophy and then as a religion is attributed to Zarathustra, but he only reformed an existing, more pagan religion of Mithraism. The popular modern image of Zarathustra, the Zoroastrian prophet, are based largely on an Iranian rock relief near Kirmanshah, Iran, from around 363 AD, showing the god Mithra. Zoroastrian fire temples are considered by followers to be symbolic gateways to Mithra, an ancient Persian sun goddess before being turned male by the Roman Empire, who had a crown of light, later symbolically portrayed as a flame-lit torch, and the perpetually lit flame found in all fire temples represent light in a spiritual context of light, not literally, and that's why it's worshipped. Zoroastrians are also sun worshippers, and rather than perceive it as a giant god flying in the sky, they likely chose the sun as the greatest, brightest, physical representation of a concept that to them is spiritual in nature. It's merely a symbol in the sky. As above, so below. The science of the stars was established through thousands of years of careful observation by philosophers of the highest order who according to Cicero and I quote the Chaldeans had records of the stars for a space of 370,000 years end quote an astounding length of time all of which they claim to have documented each child's birthday or horoscope and from that huge mass of accumulated data they calculated the effects on man during cycles of time, represented by the various planets of the zodiac. And so from there, we can better relate to one interpretation or context of the ancient hermetic saying, the astrological doctrine of the ascending macrocosm and the descending microcosm. Mithra originally had 12 followers, which stood for the 12 months, and corresponding signs of the zodiac as a solar deity and there have been many to follow this archetype Mithra had to pass through these 12 months or zodiac houses much in the same way that Hercules must face 12 labors who incidentally Saint Augustine said was one and the same with the biblical Samson in terms of astral theology a term meaning the influence of the stars on religion Shah was the title given to emperors, kings, princes, and lords of Iran. Shah on Shah is a title meaning Shah of Shahs, that is, Supreme Shah, similar to the title King of Kings. Mithra was one of the principal gods of the Proto Indo Iranian or Proto Indo European tribes. Proto just means before. So, what I'm trying to say is, at one time prior to the splitting up of the Aryans of India, Iran, Central Asia, there were one tribe, one race. Archaeologist Lewin Gua suggests they try to locate a mysterious site dating from the time of the ancient nomads. 
The nomads are thought to have Iranian origins. Here, their western roots are literally carved in stone. They say that they had red hair, bluish green eyes. These swift riders became masters of archery, ready to trade in violence when it suited their interests. Very powerful. Before long, the threat of their powerful serpentine bows would profoundly affect the course of Chinese history. One of the most important discoveries is a fully clothed woman wearing a conical hat, symbolic of a high priestess of the nomads. It would one day become the hallmark of witches in Europe. But how long did they survive here? Were the Tocharians in fact their descendants? There's no way to be sure without seeing an authentic likeness of the Tocharians. The guide knows an isolated cave with portraits of the individuals who sponsored the cave building. We see the red beard and uh, red hair parted in the middle. It's a distinctive style of the Tocharians. He's wearing a coat with wide lapels on both sides and then folded over. It's a shame that these figures have all been defaced by people of other faiths at some time in the past. But it's uh, still, it's very easy to see what they looked like and we can tell who they were. The Tocharian figures are strikingly similar to the mummies that lived in these parts a thousand years earlier. This donor has blonde hair and a long nose and an Indian caste mark, which we call a tikka. Mm -hmm. So he's a local person, the Tokarian, uh, but wearing elements of costume uh, that are Sasanian or Persian influenced and has an Indian caste mark. So we see it's a combination of various traits. A people long dead and neglected have emerged to reclaim their place in history. Mithra's first appearance in a historical record is in an inscription found at Boghaz Khoi in Anatolia, modern Turkey, dated from the 14th century BC and commemorating the treaty with two Indo-European or Aryan peoples. In the Rig Veda, sacred Aryan texts of India, Mithra and Varuna are always mentioned together, often as the double or twin god Mithra Varuna. The appearance of the Rose Cross in Christian art and poetry is often taken as a secret communication of the worship of the goddess or even secret tantric sex practices, a symbol that was carried unbroken by the shamans to the priesthood, an ancient symbol of kingship as expressed through Inanna. This image is a rose window in the Rossley Chapel in Scotland. The solar cross is probably the oldest religious symbol in the world composed of an equal arm cross within a circle. It represents the solar calendar, the movement of the sun marked by the solstices and equinoxes, and this sometimes gives it an eight-armed wheel. The swastika also represents a form of solar cross. And here we see Phoenician swastikas. The ancient ruling race of Asia Minor, including Syria and Phoenicia, called themselves Ari, meaning noble ones, and the identical racial title was used by the Hittites, who called themselves Arya. That's what the entire nation of Iran is named after, Aryans. The same ones who invaded and civilized India, Aryanizing it, giving it Sanskrit, swastikas, giving it Kali, and none of those things existed in India before the Aryans invaded on horse and chariot, and there are no horses or chariots in the Indian fossil record either, despite horses described in the ancient texts, central to the Vedic rituals, and is prominent in the earliest Hindu scriptures, the Rig Veda, but it's never shown in any of the Bronze Age Indus Valley artifacts from 3300 to 1500 BC. But those same horses are buried in the north, north of India, for thousands of years with the Aryan kings who were entertained by their gypsy subjects who retained much of the ancient knowledge of the Magi, from where we get the term magicians, and interwove it into their songs, poems, dances, and what has come down to us today is religion, which if properly deciphered, reveals these quite nicely, kept hidden and monopolized, 
by the secret societies that covertly govern the ignorant masses, who are kept ignorant of the deeper occult meanings contained in these universal symbols, in what we are told are cultures that have developed independently over the millennia. The ancient statues of Egyptian nobility and deities with their piercing blue eyes, as blue as those found in ancient Sumer and ancient Anatolia and ancient China. Which brings us to this amulet, most commonly used for protection against the evil eye for thousands of years. It's most closely associated with the goddess Anat, sometimes a consumer of blood and flesh, with archaeological evidence supporting what is contained within ancient written sources pointing towards child sacrifice forming part of the worship. Of course, I can't say this was universal, and maybe just one sect and not goddess worship in general. So I want to be clear about that. That said, Anat can be a very violent Semitic war goddess, and by Semitic I mean she was known to the Hebrews, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians and Greeks, and revered around the ancient Mediterranean and Middle East, particularly the northwestern part. Anat first appears in Egypt in the 16th dynasty, that would be the Hyksos period, a term which refers to foreign rulers as they introduced the horse to Egypt around the same time it was introduced to India. So there should be no surprise that this goddess has also been associated with Kali. Anat appears as the daughter of Ra, so she has the eight petal lotus symbol, as Inanna has the eight pointed star and Kali has her eight extra arms completing the symbology. The Hamsa is popular in North Africa, and in Arabic, the word translates to five, like the amount of fingers on the hand. But it's also an occult reference to the five-pointed star, or pentagram, an important symbol, five being associated with the planet Venus. It also refers to the Eye of Horus. In Jewish culture, the Hamsa is called Hand of Miriam. In Muslim culture, the Hand of Fatima. The Canaanites knew her as Reshef. In Biblical Hebrew, it's a noun interpreted as flame or firebolt. And in some esoteric versions, one might even come across the term lightbringer, which in Latin is Lucifer. From Aristotle, we derive our knowledge of the Pythagorean doctrine of the number five. And I quote, it is an eminently spherical and circular number because in every multiplication, it restores itself and is found terminating the number. It is change of quality because it changes what has three dimensions into the sameness of a sphere by moving circularly and producing light. And hence, light is referred to the number five, also known as the pentagrammaton, and Venus because the male three triad and the female two or dual odd and even are conjoined in it. Venus was sometimes considered hermaphrodite and as bearded as well as full bosomed." End quote. Now this can help us better understand why it is that when we look at this Roman statue of what appears to be a female Venus laying down in the nude, but when we walk around to the other side, we are confronted with the fact that this is a hermaphrodite, a symbol that embodies both male and female a visual and artistic representation of a mathematical concept that if taken literally, especially in a religious context, can possibly result in the sorts of aberrated and sexual deviant behavior we hear about involving things like what goes on, for example, at the Bohemian Grove. But the upper class in San Francisco is that way. The Bohemian Grove that I attend on time to time. But it is the most faggy goddamn thing now, according to Manley Hall, honorary 33rd degree Freemason, and I quote, five is the union of odd and even numbers, three and two. Among the Greeks, the pentagram was a sacred symbol of light, health, and vitality. It also symbolized the fifth element, ether because it is free from the disturbances of the four lower elements. It is called equilibrium because it divides the perfect number 10 into two parts." End quote. I'd like to take a minute to thank my subscribers who have recently 
contributed a donation to Atlantean Gardens, the nonprofit organization that sponsors my work and efforts. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist, producer, and author. We're very grateful for your generosity. All donations are tax deductible. We make a little go a long way. So again, I thank you. Buffy thanks you. Please have a look at my books available on Amazon.com. I'll have new material published soon, so stay tuned for that. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. Also be sure to share these videos if you find them of value. And if you take the time to leave a comment, I always take the time to read them and consider the constructive criticism as well as the encouragement, of course. So all feedback is appreciated. Our story is not quite over, but let's wrap this one up as it's gone a bit long. Thank you so much for listening with an open mind. My name is Robert Sepper, and I will see you next time.